Good morning, Moscone. How are we doing this morning, everybody? Woo! Day two of Dreamforce. There we go, there we go. Uh, my name is Chris Coolish. I'm the web development team lead at Sundog Interactive. Uh, I'm excited to be here to talk about JavaScript promises, JavaScript remoting, and Visual Force remote objects. Uh, we're going to go through a couple little stories I put together to kind of describe the scenarios, when you would use and when you wouldn't use these technologies. Uh, we'll talk about why they improve your development process. We'll also have a short demo at the end that kind of going through some code examples of how to use promises with JavaScript remoting and Visual Force remote objects. So first off, a little housekeeping. QR code to the Googles for the code. Take a snapshot of that. The code will be in the chatter feed later, but if you want to grab a picture quick, go ahead. Should take you to the GitHub repository for the, all the code that I'll show you today. All right, I'm going to go. And then one more after this. Slides. Link to the slide presentation, the slide deck out on one, one drive. OK. Oh, a few more people going. OK. About me, 12 plus years of web development experience. In that time, I've been a developer, an engineer, an architect, a team lead. Uh, personally, I'm a husband and a father. Uh, in my spare time, I enjoy homebrewing as well as playing Minecraft. And I'm a little bit of a Star Wars aficionado, which is a fancy way of saying I'm a Star Wars geek. OK, so today we're going to go on a little bit of an adventure. And we're going to follow a front-end developer through his adventures uh, on Salesforce. That developer's name is Indy. Indy's going to go on three adventures today. He's going to visit the JavaScript Pyramid of Doom. He's going to go on the last Sokol Crusade. And he's going to be part of the Raiders of the Lost Apex. So with that, we'll jump right into the first adventure. The JavaScript Pyramid of Doom. So Indy's a front-end web developer. He's just getting into Salesforce for the first time, and he's working on a Visual Force page. And right now, this Visual Force page is just calling out to some external websites. It's just doing some asynchronous code. And so as he's working through it and, and coding it up, he starts running into callback hell. This is what callback hell feels like, people. It feels like your heart is being pulled out of your chest. Now, if you don't know what callback hell is, it looks a little something like this. You have JavaScript function nested within JavaScript function nested within JavaScript function, and the code just continues going to the right, and you have no idea where you're at. Indy is terrified of the JavaScript pyramid of doom. What should Indy do? JavaScript promises. JavaScript promises are a proxy object in JavaScript uh, that are the end result of an asynchronous re process. So making a call out via AJAX or something else like that. They allow you to attach success handlers and failure handlers to this proxy object that are triggered when your asynchronous result completes. So if it's a success, your success handler fires. If it's a failure, the failure one fires. So why should you use JavaScript privacies? Like I said, they simplify asynchronous code. Instead of getting the pyramid of doom, you get a much nicer syntax that looks a lot more like a try-catch block. It's easier to read. It's easier to follow as a developer. You can also use it to sequ sequence asynchronous code. So if you have asynchronous callbacks that are dependent on one another, you can ensure the one fires after the other without going too crazy like that. And now you can also transform values with it, which doesn't necessarily have to be an asynchronous result. If you have a, a, a value, an object, or something that you want to run through and transform from one type of value to another, you can use promises to do that in a clean way. On to our next adventure, the last Sokol Crusade. So Indy's avoided the Pyramid of Doom uh, and called back hell. And he's feeling pretty good about himself. But now he's got all these external calls, and it's time to get some data from Salesforce. And he's a front-end web developer. He's like, well, what do I do? How am I, how am I going to get this data? And he comes to realize that he's going to have to use the mysterious Soko. So th that's the look on a front-end developer's face when you tell him he's got to write a Soko query. 
Uh, Circle's not too hard, but you know, from a front-end developer standpoint, you're not kind of used to that stuff. So it's a little bit out of, out of their wheelhouse. So what is Indy going to do? How is he going to get the Salesforce data into his Visual Force page without having to use Soco? Remote objects. Remote objects are, again, a proxy object in JavaScript. Uh, they are mapped to custom objects and standard objects in Salesforce. And then they have method calls on them that map to the different DML statements. So from your JavaScript code, you can manipulate records in, Visual, or in Salesforce without having to use any Apex code. So again, why should you use them? They're simple. There's no Apex required. You just have to add a few tags to your Visual Force page. We'll see that later on in the demo. It's JavaScript, but it doesn't count against your API request limits. You're still limited to your Visual Force limits that are there, but it's not the actual uh, API limits that you have within your org. And ultimately, because you're moving some of this client access stuff, the data access stuff, to the client side, uh, you're ultimately going to build a better user experience, uh, leveraging AngularJS, ReactJS, different front end libraries that way. So on to our last adventure, the Raiders of the Lost Apex. So Indies used uh, Visual, Visual Force Remote objects to get past uh, the last Soku Crusade. Uh, JavaScript promises to avoid having to do, avoid callback hell in the Pyramid of Doom. Now Indies on and discovers that, hey, there is some code in Salesforce, some Apex code that I need to use on this page. But uh, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get this Apex code. Am, am I going to have to, to create it? And that's when it dawns on them. He's going to have to write duplicate code. So there's this Apex logic out there that needs to do something. And now he has to replicate that on the client side. That would result in duplicate code. And he's terrified. He's like, I don't want to duplicate all this code. I don't know what it does. I don't know. I don't have unit tests to cover it or anything like that. What am I going to do? JavaScript remoting. JavaScript remoting allows you to call Apex methods from your JavaScript. Uh, that way, you don't have to reduplicate code. You can reuse existing code throughout. Why should you use JavaScript remoting? Like I said, reuse Apex code on the client side. If you have some complex stuff you've written in Apex, don't duplicate it on the client side. Leave that heavy lifting back in Apex, where it's unit tested and all that fun stuff. Uh, you can also use it to alleviate view state issues. On larger Visual Force pages, you'll end up having to they'll slow down because you're keep tracking so much stuff there. Um, ultimately, you can build a better user experience again. You're using front-end technologies. You can leverage the front-end frameworks, again, like AngularJS or ReactJS to just build a better user experience. All right, on to the demos. All right, so the first demo I'm going to go through is we're just going to take a look at a Visual Force page with remote objects in it, just kind of show you how I set that up and as well as how I'm using promises to do the work on them. So the first thing to note with JavaScript remote objects is the first tag we got to use is a remote objects tag right here on line four. Um, the remote objects tag is sort of the, the allows you to do some configuration stuff with the remote objects framework. Um, and it has some really nice helper attributes, the main one being JS namespace. That allows you to namespace your models that Visual Force Remote Objects puts together in a separate JavaScript namespace so you, don't have, you can avoid collisions if you need to. Uh, the next tag we end up using here on line 7 is Remote Object Model. Now, these tags, you can have more than one. And these are the tags that map back to your objects within Salesforce. Uh, and so here, I'm mapping back to the account object. And I'm pulling the fields ID and name. Those are the two most important attributes of, of that particular tag. You can also declare fields another way, <coughs> and that's using the remote object field tag. This tag maps one to one back to a field. And what's really nice about it is you can give it a nice fancy JavaScript name versus a Salesforce name. So here, I'm referencing the number of locations double underscore C field in, in Salesforce. And then in my JavaScript, I can reference it with a friendlier name, number of locations. And so that's it. Uh, those are the three objects or the three tags that I need to get remote using remote objects on my, on my Visual Force page. As we scroll down here in the JavaScript, we'll start getting into the promise stuff. So what I've done here is I've simply uh, just added a, a handler on, on page load, on the window load. Within that handler, uh, I'm instantiating my promise. Now, I'm using the Q framework. Um, JavaScript promises are native to ES6, but depending on the browsers you have to use, you might need a framework to shim that functionality into your browser. And so I'm using the Q framework, which allows you to just call the promise function on it. <coughs> 
and then pass in your executor function. Now your executor function is what's going to do your asynchronous call. And we can see that function passed in here. The executor functions pass two other arguments. You can see them here in line 15. You have the resolve function and the reject function. The resolve function is what you pass the successful result of your asynchronous call to to continue through the success handlers. The reject function is what you pass an error message or something to to trigger the error handling handlers that you assign. And we'll see that later on here. So now we've kind of entered the promised land a little bit. Here we are now starting to look at some of the, uh, the actual Visual Force Remote Objects code. So here on line 17, I'm instantiating my Visual Force Remote Object. You can see I'm calling, I'm instantiating VRO to new sfdc.account. So there's that JS namespace right there, as well as the uh, object that I was using. We're going to use the retrieve met method, which retrieves records from using Visual Force Remote Objects. And that retrieve method ultimately takes a criteria and a callback attribute. The criteria argument is just the filters you would use on your, on your query. So here I'm simply using order by to order by my results uh, as uh, ascending, and I'm limiting it to five. There's also where clauses and different things you can put in here. So check the documentation to find out everything that you can do with it. And then here's our callback function on line 28. Callback functions in Visual Force remote objects take three arguments, an error, a results, and an event. And so you use those to check for errors and pass on your results. Here, I'm checking to see if error isn't null. If it's set to something, hey, that means that there's an error. In this case, I'm going to call my reject handler to trigger my error handlers and pass it the message I got back from Visual Force Remote Objects. If it's a success, I simply just pass on the results to my resolve function. And so that was just my callback method. And now here's the actual asynchronous call. I'm calling the retrieve method on my Visual Force Remote Object and then passing in the criteria and the callback. So now we're going to get into some more of the promise stuff again. So first off, what I'm doing is I'm calling the catch method. The catch method I'm calling on my promise is what you assign error handlers to. Um, you simply just pass it in a function, and that function accepts one argument. That's the value you passed through using the reject method. So in th this case, it's a string with the error message. All I'm simply doing here is I'm using handlebars.js to compile a template and spit it out to a div on the page. Here you can see I'm passing that reason into the context. And then here's my handlebars.js code to compile and then render it out to the page. After the catch fu function, the catch call on line 53, we're doing our first success handler. And so you use the then method to define those. And you can do multiple success handlers. You can chain them together. And so it, it just accepts one argument. This is the first one, so this is getting the actual results from my Visual Force remoting call, uh, which is just a record straight out of Salesforce. What I'm doing here in this first one is I'm actually uh, normalizing this object return from Salesforce. I'm just normalizing it into a JSON object. So I've created an accounts array. I'm looping through the record's results and passing it to a function that pushes them into that accounts array. And so this record object right here is actually one of the objects that is returned from Visual Force remote objects. And I'm using the get method to get values from the various fields. So here you can see the ID and the name field, as well as the number of locations field that I translated from the custom field into my JavaScript friendly name. There's another method for setting that you use the same sort of syntax. You can set values on it. And then you could use some of the other DML functions to manipulate that record. Here at the end of this, we're returning accounts. And so what this is, uh, does is allows us to change those success, chain those success handlers together. And so we go into the second success handler. And what am I doing? I'm passing in the accounts for, that I just normalized. And I'm using handlebars.js to spit those out on the page with the handlebars.js template. So that's all the JavaScript code. As we go further down the page, we just kind of see some of my markup, the accounts, the error div, the accounts page, uh, the div the, the, the loading accounts go. And then my handlebars templates that just show rendering out those, uh, those context objects on the page. Here I'm including the Q library and the handlebars JS library. So let's go ahead and jump over to the demo page. It's a beaut, let me tell you. So here you can see my account names and the number of locations, that custom field. So if we hit a refresh, you saw my loading screen. And ta-da, we got records from Salesforce. And all that was done without any Apex code. So for my second demo, uh, we're just going to take a look at a remoting example. And so the remoting example has to start uh, in a different spot. It has to start back in the apex. You've got to have an apex method to call 
and you're remoting. And so here, while I've created a controller and put a remote action method in my controller, this could be any Apex class at all. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a controller associated with your Visual Force page. It could be some random class that you want to expose as a remoting action. So here we're defining our class. And here, here's our, remote, our remote, remoting method. So you have to declare it global and static. You have to annotate it with the remote action annotation. And then it just simply does your work in there. And so here you can see we're turning an array of accounts. Um, and just, again, selecting out the ID, name, and number of locations field, ordering it by name, and limiting it to five records. And then we have our exception here. So if we jump over to the actual page, this one jumps right into the JavaScript. There's no extra tags or anything you have to add to the page for annotations. Um, so we have the same uh, event listener load happening. We go into the promise framework again. And again, we're in our executor function. And so here, we're going to define our callback method that we're going to pass to a remoting method that gets called on success. Uh, JavaScript remoting callback method takes two arguments, a uh, result argument and an event argument. The result is obviously the result, what you're returning back from your remoting method, and the event just gives you some information to help do error handling. So here we're checking event.status on line 11 to see if it's true. If it's true, call was a success, pass my results onto my, my resolve, my success handlers. If it's an error, uh, you come back, and we're going to pass it on to the reject handler, which is going to trigger our error handlers uh, for it. So we're passing event.message there. And then here on line 25 is the actual uh, remoting call. So here I'm just using the Apex class name and then that static method that we, that we declared with the remote action uh, annotation. And then I'm passing in my callback. And then now the code looks a lot the same. I have my catch putting in my error handler. And that's exactly the same as in the previous demo. The first success handler is a little bit different because JavaScript promoting, depending on what you're turning, is just returning raw JSON. So my normalization is a little bit simpler. Here I'm looping through those records again and just referencing those fields by the names, ID, name, and then my custom field name. And then passing it on to the second success handler, uh, which is, again, just simply rendering it out using handlebars.js to the web page. Same uh, div for errors, save div for accounts, and then the same handlebars templates from our previous example. And so if we hop over to the demo there, same thing. We get objects back returned from JavaScript promoting without having, well, writing very little Apex code. So I'll show you a little example of error handling here. Uh, if we go back to the remoting controller and we take off and add that throw back in there. And we refresh the page. We get our error. Indiana, what's the dog's name? So what we're doing here is, what's good to know here is that, as you can see, we still got the no accounts message down here, didn't we? What's good to note is that the order that you define your error handlers and success handlers matters. The fact that we did our error handler first here means that this caught on the first error from the remoting object. But it still fell through to these other success handlers. If I were to move catch from this location in the code to the end of the code, you wouldn't see the, the two success handlers fire, and it would still say loading in that page. So I'm going to get a little risky, and we're going to give it a shot. So there, we still get our error message, but it still says the loading screen. So depending on how you structure those handlers, uh, you can do some different things with how you, your user interface responds to it. So that's it for code demos for me. Do we have any questions? Uh, there's mics uh, out in the audience. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Hi. Can you uh, use any um, uneditable fields in your remote objects created by or anything like that? Is there a way around the? Can you can you edit them or? Uh, can you? We had, I had issues using remote objects before, where if I declared at the top, say created by, then when my object tried to save, it was trying to update that regardless, even if I wasn't changing the values. Is there any way around that? I don't believe so. I don't think editing those fields in remote objects or in 
JavaScript promoting is going to have any effect? Well, in my case, we weren't editing the fields, but we were declaring them so we could you show them. Can you speak in the mic a little bit? I'm sorry. Uh, in my case, we weren't actually editing the fields. We were just displaying them. But because oh. they were uh, declared at the top in the object, when you tried to save the object, it tried to update it anyway, even though it was with the same data. And so the, the page would fail. Huh. I, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to take a closer look. We have any other questions? So um, with the uh, remoting, the controllers have to be declared g global. Um, so that has an impact with managed packages, doesn't it, in terms of uh, updates and other things, limitations? Uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, it does have an effect, I believe. It doesn't have to be necessarily the controller. It can just be a, a regular class. But yeah, it, it does have some effect there. OK. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on what those impacts might be. Not 100% sure. I'd have to take a look, closer look at that and what the ramifications were. But I know in, in our past, we haven't had too many problems using it. We use the JavaScript promoting quite a bit. Um, and we haven't had in orgs that have a lot of managed packages. And we don't run into too many issues with it. So well, are you talking about if you have a managed package and you're deploying out? The, deploying out? Right. In, in other words, obviously, the, the main class has to be global in order to have a global method. Yep. So once you've declared it global, you can never go back to public, for example. Right. So I, probably it just takes a little bit of planning to say what, you know, you probably don't want to ad hoc just throw in a global method like that. You probably want to plan out a little bit further and say, OK, I, I'm going to expo expose a particular class as my remoting service or remoting front end. And then I'm going to have my business logic or my other logic I want to expose in another class that's probably, that is going to have remoting objects. So you're only, you're defining one class that ex explicitly for your remoting calls and then reusing your logic someplace else. In other words, you're saying that you want to call service classes for your business logic. Yeah. And keep everything separate for your yep. page. Thank you. All right. Oh, go ahead. That first example, it was a, a retrieve method that yep. you were using. What considerations would you have if you want to make that, this, um, that, that page also be able to support updates to the records? Can you just, uh, is there data binding with those fields um, with JavaScript promises, or do you need to write a remote method for update? If you were to, if you were to, I mean, basically turn it into a single page application at that point, being able to read, write, update. Um, you know, I would probably move closer to a React or an AngularJS framework um, versus just kind of doing vanilla JavaScript. The two-way data binding on those generally helps with that sort of thing. Uh, I think being able to normalize your objects as well, don't necessarily use the objects that you're given directly from remoting or something like that. Normalize it to JSON or something like that. Um, with Visual Force remoting, um, you end up doing a little bit of translation because the update methods, like with retrieve, it's almost like a static call in a class coming back. When you get into the updates and the DML, uh, the updates and the inserts, um, that class then becomes the record you're trying to update. So then you sort of have to instantiate one of those remoting classes for each one of those records you want to do. So the paradigm's a little weird that way. You still kind of end up with, you know, for me, if it was an AngularJS app, um, probably in my services layer, I'd, I'd abstract that out. So I'd have an AngularJS service that was interacting with my Visual Force remote objects and sort of normalizing those different conditions and returning just various plain old simple JavaScript objects and arrays back to my controller to then use templates and data bind to the page. Does that help? OK. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for attending my session. Have a great day.